from the rock and tonight we have students and administration member from the International Theological Institute in Austria the ITI a prestigious uh, school that turns out a fair number of uh, teachers in this country we'll be talking with them uh, uh, this show and we'll be talking about what's special about their school and, uh, and we'll be having a Ten Commandment quiz as well I uh, hope not. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but what you got on there? You're dressed in a dramatic fashion. This oh is. Boy. This is the new cutting edge Life on the Rock t shirt, ladies and gentlemen. You too can have one of these for a mere, I don't know exactly what they cost, but you can buy one of these from a religious catalog. You can right. go online, you can get one of these picked up. Uh, stylish. You can leave the price tag on it if you want, although that makes no sense. Uh, to do so, $18, I believe, is what it is. Hold on, it's coming to me. Yes, $18 from the Religious Catalog. You can get yourself a brand new Life on the Rock t shirt, or you can call the 800 number that you see right here on the screen and so we check have one out. Jesus Christ and different virtues uh, yes. that we. We talk about on the show, and so it's a, a great, a great shirt you can get from uh, Religious yeah. Kettle. And, it's, and these things are always a contribution to to EWTN. I mean, you have to understand that you know, this is uh, this is something that always benefits the wearer, of course, but it also benefits EWTN and helps this network continue to do this great work of spreading the gospel message throughout the hills and beyond. Right. You know, this week I was reading. Uh, our Holy Father recently visited Sicily. And he was meeting with young people and families in Sicily, and he said something that caught my attention. He referred to, on September 25th, a young girl, Chiara Badano, an Italian a young woman who died at 18 in Rome, was beatified, September 25th. And he said, I invite you, he's talking to young people, I invite you to become acquainted with her. And in this address, he talks about her virtues and the virtues of family life. And I thought we'd talk about that tonight and try to hopefully introduce her to young people and have that can foster a devotion to her. And her life, she started out, uh, she was born in 1971, and very normal life, very athletic. She loved hiking and swimming and singing and dancing. Initially, when she was a young girl, wanted to be a flight attendant. Uh, later, when she was a, a teenager, she, wanted, uh, she felt drawn to religious life. But she contracted a, a form of cancer when she was 16. And she would suffer, and it went into, it was on her shoulder, and it went and traveled into her, her bones and her spine, leaving her paralyzed and from her waist down, I believe. And um, for three, almost three years, she suffered with this, and there was a lot of intense pain and everything. But she was known for her joy and for uh, being like a beacon of light in the family and to her friends around. I said, at 19 years, full of life, and full of life, love, and faith. Her last two years were also full of pain, the Pope writes, yet always of love and light, a light that shone around her that came from within, from her heart filled with God. How was this possible? And he goes on to speak about, obviously, how it's a grace, a gift from the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, how we can be joyful in the midst of very difficult sufferings. And he also talks about the role of her parents. And he, he stresses this, that the importance of family, how that is to be, the family is to be a collaborator with God that, you know, obviously passes on life, you know, is procreative, but also is to transmit the faith, which is the seed of this light, you know, this, this grace and glory and the person. And the, fa the, the family is, is a, he refers to the family as a church in miniature, you know, because it's transmitting God in a sense, you know, and, and transmitting the faith to the young person. And uh, I just thought that was such a beautiful mm. message to, to think about. It is. The, high, the great vocation of family life. And also how you know, a young person who died at, I think it was 18, uh, you know, could achieve such heights of sanctity. You know, we, sometimes we get discouraged. We might, we might not have the best family situation. Mm. We might live in a difficult culture. 
but sanctity is possible. This, this young girl died in 1990. You know, it's not that long ago. You know, sanctity is possible, and these, these blesseds and saints are held up to us by the church to inspire us. You know? Well, and there's so much in the air in today's climate, society, and culture that says that young people are simply going to, you know, fall into the ways of the world, and they're going to have that rebellious attitude, and, and it's just kind of something, I hear this from parents, you know, that it's just going to happen. They're kids. They're going to do that. And, you know, this is an example of how, no, that doesn't have to happen. It isn't, it's, it's not a genetic uh, defect that kids are going to go through rebellious periods and they're going to end up, you know, opposing God and abandoning the faith and such. I mean, it can happen, but it doesn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. She's a great example of someone who not only did not rebel, but took a tremendous cross and united it with the cross of Christ. And from that, great fruit, you know, uh, comes from that. And, 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 you know, the Holy Father is, is, is so incredibly wise already. I mean, he's, he's a brilliant man. But, but, but taking this to this level of faith Everybody suffers. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember hearing that years ago. So whether you're rich or poor, you know, no matter Father what Stan. culture you're in. That's Father Stan's song. He sings that. Oh, does he? Oh, <laughs> I, I'm not familiar with the song, no. but I remember just being in, in, uh, in hearing a priest say that, uh, you know, everybody has a cross. You know, years ago, the first time I, I heard that very clearly, meaning I heard it inside, is mm -hmm. that we all have a cross. She's a great example of, of a young individual who took a serious cross and offered it up to our Lord. Right. And at, towards the end of her life, she would tell her friends, she said, uh, yet it is true, you know, God loves me. And after a very troubled night, she came to say, I suffered a lot, but my soul was singing. You can't even imagine what my relationship with Jesus is like now. I feel that God is asking me for something more, something greater. I could be confined to this bed for years. I don't know. I'm only interested in God's will, doing that well in the present moment playing God's game, as she would refer to it. And at the end of her life, the Pope quotes her as saying, you know, bye, Mom, be happy because I am. Mm. You know, she just had this great light, peace, obvious joy, uh, despite this suffering, in this suffering. And, and what she endured and her attitude about it, I mean, what, I mean, not so much what she endured, but her attitude and how she responded to God's grace is attainable for all of us. Right. It's not right. set apart just for a unique few. Right. We can all, by the grace of God, you know, have that sense of joy. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with the ITI, the International Theological Institute. They'll be telling us about their school and the great things going on there. So don't go away. We'll be back in a minute. One of the most pressing questions uh, facing the modern world, I think, is the question of truth, which the modern world seems to have actually despaired of the answer. What is the meaning of my life? What is the meaning? People are searching for meaning. I think the deepest question of the human heart is, am I loved? Welcome back to Life on the Rock. We have the ITI, the International Theological Institute. We're joined by Catherine Gardner and Scott Hel Heffelfinger. Excellent. And uh, uh, Eugene Wallace, a Board of Trustees member and adjunct professor. Scott, you're an adjunct professor and a student. Yeah. And Catherine is a, you'd say, a graduate right from the ITI. Mm -hmm. So first let's talk about... Um, you know, the ITI, how big it is, how old it is, where it's located. Maybe, uh, Eugene, if you could kick us off with that. Sure, sure. Uh, it started in 1995, and uh, in 96, Michael Waldstein came and uh, really, as first president, brought the ITI into existence and brought the forum, the format. And, and Cardinal Schoenborn? Is Cardinal Schoenborn is the Grand Chancellor. Mm -hmm. John Paul II asked that the, the institute be... Uh, domiciled, brought to Austria. And uh, then Archbishop Schoenborn took it on and 
Uh, it's been amazing ever since. What, what has come about uh, through the stewardship of many, many people, uh, Franciscan University, Cardinal Schoenborn, Mikhail Waldstein, a whole host of uh, individuals and organizations has become a phenomenal cornerstone and uh, a place in Europe to reach out to Eastern Europeans and Western Europeans and, and bring together in one place a community of the Catholic faithful in the pursuit of, of wisdom, the pursuit of truth. Okay. And how, how many students there roughly now? About 70 this year. 70. Uh, it's one of the largest classes, if not the largest. And the degrees you offer? It's an STM, and I'll let Scott speak to this a bit too, but uh, an STM and a master's and a licensure and a doctorate. And uh, mm -hmm. Scott is in process now, and Catherine and I both have master's degrees. And Eugene, you were part of the first class, right? Uh, that's true. Right. That's true. <laughs> Did Cardinal Schoenberg teach there at any point? Or? You know, he, he didn't teach. He really, he supported it. He came yeah. off and, and uh, uh, celebrated liturgy with us. And uh, he supported not just in words, but in deeds. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. it was uh, powerful. Now, Scott, you are, uh, well, tell us about your degree from there and your role now. Yeah, so I'm a student there, <coughs> and I began in the, the master's program, which if you do the whole course of studies, it's a five-year program. Mm -hmm. If you have some formation before that in philosophy or theology, then you come for the two years or the two years with a preparatory year. And um, I completed my master's work there, got my degree. During that time, I began teaching for Franciscan University, actually at their Austrian campus. And after doing that and getting my degree, I decided to continue with the ITI because it was such a a wonderful place to study and um, wonderful academics, wonderful community, great mission in the heart of Europe, in the part of the new evangelization. Um, so I wanted to stay and pursue my licentiate, which mm -hmm. is the next degree in the kind of series of church degrees. So I'm working on that. And then as a licentiate student, um, one of my responsibilities is, is teaching part-time when there's a class that needs to be taught or doing that. And I love a chance to give back to the students and share some of what I've received through my, my formation at the ITI and um, through the teaching that I did for Franciscan University. And tell us, where is it located? Can you describe its, the city it's in and things? Yeah, so it's, it's just outside of Vienna. And um, this is very significant. The town is called Trumau. And Vienna was the, the last capital of a unified Europe when Europe was really what we would call Christendom. And um, Vienna brought together both the eastern part of Europe and the western part. And this is why it was called the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Austro being the Austrian western part, Hungro being the Hungarian kingdom there. And these were united, bringing together west and east and these two different cultures and ways of thinking. And this produced a rich um, empire, a rich kingdom. And so we're situated there. And the reason it's so fitting for the ITI um, is because... Um, at the ITI, you have this small school that somehow embodies and captures this great universal thing that we call the Catholic Church. And one of the biggest ways we do that is by being a school that has both the Western rites of the Church, which is the Latin rite, and then also the Eastern rites, which involves a whole variety of rites like the Byzantine rite, the Ruthenian rite, and Armenian, and all of these things. So these two rites come together, and they have different ways of, of approaching theology, they have different um, expressions of the liturgy, even though, of course, it's the one holy sacrifice of the Mass. Mm -hmm. And this universal environment and international flair and culture um, really provides the most Catholic context for studying and pursuing Catholic wisdom. And that's a really, really exciting part of the community and the life and the studies at the mm -hmm. ITI. So you, you can get these theological degrees, also philosophy... So the, the degrees are all theological degrees. They're all graduate degrees. Right. And the main program is what's called the STM, which is a Master's in Sacred Theology. Okay. And one can apply to this with, with a bachelor's degree, without a bachelor's degree. And the admissions committee determines where you would enter the program. So you can be fresh out of high school and you have a courageous heart, longing for wisdom, very mature. <laughs> you come to Europe wanting the culture and this experience and the studies and you'll do the whole five-year program. If you have gone to a school where you have philosophical or theological formation, then it will be determined, well, you probably would enter at year four, and you do the two-year master's degree. So you can only end up with a minimum of a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And so we have this master's in sacred theology, the heart of the program. 
Then in addition to that, we have a Master's of Marriage and Family, which is a degree oriented towards people who have studied psychology or history or anything else, and they want to serve the church and the family, which is at the heart of the ITI's mission to be in the service of the family, which is mm -hmm. great with the saint that you were talking right, about. Very right. appropriate. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And so we want to support that, and this degree is to help people go and start family centers, um, counseling centers, advising, to support and foster Christian holy families. Um, it's a little bit more of a practical degree. And let, let's maybe go right with a story. You were telling me a great story about, a, or I forgot, it was Eugene, about uh, the, the guy who went to... Yeah, this is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So, the, and Scott did a beautiful job, and we'll talk maybe hopefully about the four pillars of the mm -hmm. ITI, the, the foundational uh, instruments and foundational uh, pillars that, upon which it's, it's uh, built. But the, by bringing Eastern Europeans to be present in the ITI, they encountered a, a, a place where in which they can be transformed. So when we were there with the first class, a group of Eastern Europeans came freshly from under the uh, communist regime. And they were huddled. It was a bit chilly and uh, just encountered them and tried to invite them in. They, they weren't smiling and weren't very, uh, they were quite reserved and, and hesitant, not certain of wh wh what they were going to experience. But through the, the ITI, they uh, transformed. One of, one of our graduates uh, went back to his home country formerly a communist country, and did work. Uh, he was working in, with uh, marriage preparation. He got a knock on his door. It was the government saying, hey, uh, we were doing an investigation, and we'd like to uh, talk with you because you have come up as within this in investigation. Your name came up. Uh, he was a little taken aback that mm -hmm. the government was knocking on his door. But they said, we have found through a study that divorce rates were dramatically lower in this region and we investigated, and the common denominator is your marriage preparation program. Mm. So here's an ITI-formed uh, individual, he's a priest, who was back in his country doing marriage preparation that was having a dramatic impact, and they said, would you please consider doing this for the rest of the country? Right. So that's a powerful impact, to, to be able to, to come in, be transformed, freshly out of a communist regime, and now actually Austria has asked, we'd like to consider your marriage preparation program. So the ITI is having a real impact upon marriage and family, a real impact, particularly in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Right. I, I love that story because sometimes, uh, you know, with the schools and academia, you think, what am I going to do with this? And then we see a great example of this wisdom, you know, mm -hmm. being taught, transforming culture. Uh, yeah. Catherine, can you tell us about your story? Because you have a lot of different elements to your journey to ITI and uh sure yeah um well right before I was at the ITI I was discerning a vocation with the Dominicans in Nashville I know a lot of you know <laughs> know mm -hmm. them there they're a great community um and when I came out I was trying to determine how to continue my education and um the ITI stood out as kind of a unique option I hadn't finished my bachelor's degree. I'd done some studies before um, and continued some while I was with the community, but I didn't have a completed degree. Um, and the nice thing about the flexibility of the, the degree at the ITI is that they can sort of assess what classes you've had so far, how they would fit, and then determine how much you need to continue to finish mm -hmm. the degree. So I was there for three years. I took the master's program and then an extra year. but. Um, I mean, on the, on the first level, I was looking for a Thomistic graduate program, something strongly founded in the heart of the church, something that involved the texts immediately. That was a classroom discussion mm -hmm. style. I really wanted that um, for learning. But what was special about the mm -hmm. ITI was that um, the community is not really formed just of uh, you know, 18 to 20-year-olds who are fresh out of high school and all doing the same mm -hmm. thing. It's, it's formed out of... Um, really the biggest variety you could imagine of students. There's married students, there's religious students, there's those on the road to religious life, east and west, and there's a certain maturity in the community there um, where the practice of faith in vocations, in the permanent mm -hmm. vocations of life, is really the foundation of the study, and the study takes, it takes on a special nature within that, which really attracted me. Right, I, I like that. But when you were talking about it earlier to me, you. I thought of like that expression about the church breathing with both lungs, the east and the west. 
Yeah. And as uh, Scott uh, described, how that you know Vienna there is a mm. you know, a border zone for that. Um, but I know that I was I was sharing with you. I studied at Steubenville one summer, and they had a lot of Eastern students that had come from a persecuted church. You know, and I remember, and they did bring a maturity to it. You know, we were like these free Americans and never had to worry about that. <laughs> and uh, and I, I can remember there was a. Uh, a seriousness and thing that an attitude they had that they took you know this is this is important you know what we're doing yeah that's that's a big thing about the Easterners I mean the Westerners as well because there was there was a variety of married or, or religious mm -hmm. that had a certain maturity too but what was really beautiful about studying with Eastern right students which I hadn't ever done before was um, there for those who had been under recently under communist regimes and so on the faith was not at all to be taken for granted it was mm -hmm. something that a lot had been sacrificed for. I had um, a classmate who's uh, a member of her family had been in prison for, for uh, from age 16 to 32, I think, because he had um, spoken about being at an underground mass. Right. And um, the uh, the sense that there had been bishops in Romania, for example, something like seven bishops who died in prison mm -hmm. during the persecution, fathers who were um, hiding their, the fact that they were priests uh, from from the government and everyone. And the, the price that was paid for the faith there is something that I don't think we could appreciate without having real friendships with these people and seeing right. the impact it had on them right. and the way they, the weight with which they take the things they're studying. You know? I know before I studied with some international students, I was kind of dismissive of that. I, you mm -hmm. know, I was like, what's the bottom line? Let's learn some of the material and, yeah. you know, but they... That, that different perspective really enriches things. And uh, I think another great point, well, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back with uh, talking about the value of studying in Europe physically. And uh, so we'll be back in just a minute. I was looking for different graduate programs for theology, and uh, one of the programs was this small little school in Austria. One of the things that I really looked forward to about the ITI was the seminar method of reading texts closely, preparing them carefully, and then being able to discuss them with other people. And since I had studied at a big university in the States beforehand, I would had lots of lectures, and information was just given to me. Um, but afterward, I had realized that I wasn't sure how much I had really learned. And so when I came to the ITI, um, it was my first experience of getting an extremely difficult text, trying to make some sense of it, trying to prepare how I would want to argue from the text or present the text to other people, to take that to the classroom and then be challenged by other people, to be led a little bit by a professor in the classroom, and through those challenges and through the guidance, um, we really arrived, I think, at something of, of the truth. And it was something of the truth that we could make our own, that we could remember afterward, because we had all worked so hard to reach this little glimpse. Hi, welcome back to Life on the Rock, and tonight we're talking to people from the ITI, the International Theological Institute. And we'll go right to Doug. Doug's burning with a question. But yeah, the image, before we come back from the break of the Blessed Mother of Our Lady Guadalupe, with the numbers counting down, five, four, three. Did you ever think in 1531 when Juan Diego received that, that miracle of the tilma that one day we'd have numbers counting down over the front of that image on a modern day TV show? The whole audience is dumbfounded by that question. But no, <laughs> that wasn't my original question. Here's my question. We're talking about, before we went to the break, you know, Catherine, you're talking about the persecution that some of these students have endured in their countries and how that deepens their appreciation for the faith. They've seen and known of the stories and the lives of bishops and priests and such who've suffered and been tormented and families who have to, you know, hide what they're teaching their kids and so forth about the faith. In America and other parts of the world that have been so westernized and so... Uh, advanced, if you want to use that term, um, there's a blasé attitude about the faith. There's a carefree attitude. There's a 
you know, it's, it's not that bad, it's not that big a deal. Do we need to reach that level of persecution before we appreciate it? Can we penetrate the blasé attitude without having to go through a certain type of persecution? I'm not a fan of making the faith cool because it's more of an emotional approach of making things flashy and the cross is not flashy. It's not about cool, it's about truth. And as you mentioned in the clip, Scott, before we came back, um, that we just saw uh, th that element of truth and working hard to find that truth and recognizing that truth, in your opinion, the three of you from your work and your experience, what do we do to reach those people? That what it, some say 70, 80, 90% of Catholics in America who just really mm. don't get it and don't care sometimes. What's your, what are your thoughts on that? Eugene, start with you. Yeah, it's a great question. I was just in a discussion group in uh, Portland, Oregon and with one of the bishops and we got to, to this question. What, how, do, how do we uh, draw in Catholics, particularly young Catholics? And it's about the truth. How do you help them to access the truth? Who's speaking up for the truth? And where that occurs, whether it's at the ITI or whether it's at their seminary in Minnesota that's overflowing with new seminarians. Uh, in Slovakia and Poland, over, the seminaries are overflowing with young men who are pursuing a religious life. So what is it, what's the common element there that, that is causing the, it, it's the truth. It's not watering it down. It's, it's, it's uh, helping them to access it, presenting the truth in a compelling fashion, but nonetheless the truth. I mean, who wants to join an organization or a religious order or whatever it might be uh, come and we're going to be blasé and we're going to have lukewarm teachings and everybody's going to feel good. But when you stand up and you say, here is what the teachings of the church are. And, and for, at the ITI, what we do is we access the, the source materials, Thomas Aquinas and, and the, the church, doctors of the church. And, and when you access it together and you're transformed. So how do we get young people together to access the truth in an uncompromising way? I think... Uh, I think that's a, that's a solution, and ITI is one of those solutions, obviously. And, and a lot of our graduates are coming back to the United States having encountered this communal life, the East and the West coming together, theology as an integrated whole, studies of marriage and the family, just working uh, and being transformed by the truth that they encounter. When they come back to the United States, whether it's at Wyoming College or, or any of these other institutions, Catherine's studying at Ave Maria to, to, uh, for her Ph.D., these folks are well prepared to come back and impact the culture just as, as the priest who went back to his uh, Eastern European country is impacting because they encounter the truth unabashedly, uh, so uncompromisingly. Would you say we need a bolder approach? We need, we need, we need bolder speaking, bolder preaching, more clear, uncompromising, uncompromising. But, but just between the eyes, yeah. which is true charity. Well, well, is well it, it is, not? and it's encountering the truth. It's not, tell, it's not me telling you what the truth is. Right. It's you and I saying, what does this text say and what does it mean to my life? It's not book knowledge. It's an encounter so that it, it, as Scott said so well in that clip, you own it because you've had to fight for it. And somebody says, no, I don't think that's what it means, Doug. And you say, well, what are you talking about? And you, you actually can break open the text and let the truth itself transform you because you have a choice when you encounter the truth. Deny it or allow it to change you. Mm -hmm. And Scott, you got a great story. I, I like your story. Can you tell us about your conversion? I think it involves some of these themes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I, um, as I mentioned actually in the, the clip that just aired, uh, I was studying at UC Berkeley in California, which is a very large university. And um, UC Berkeley, if you didn't catch that. A <laughs> little bit secular, a little bit liberal. <laughs> And Whoa. while I was there, <laughs> <coughs> I, I fell away from my faith in the first couple of years with some intellectual questions. My first roommate um, was a wonderful guy but was an atheist, and that made me ask questions about, well, who is this God, and does he really exist? And so I had some intellectual difficulties, which I later realized were just compounded by a kind of moral laziness. I had these questions, never picked up a book, never asked a question, never looked for the answer, but just sort of gave me an excuse to stop going to Mass. So I did that over the first couple of years. And then in my third year there, I had a really powerful conversion experience through um, a wonderful friend who introduced me to, to Christ, who was a, a non-Catholic friend. Um, he was evangelical? Yeah, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. um, and she was so convinced of, of Christ, and I thought, this is amazing, this love and this joy, what is this? 
and I was really taken by that. And then I began to think, well, why am I, why am I Catholic? I'd started going to some um, Christian, evangelical, non-denominational um, Bible studies and things, and some issues came up, and I thought, well, why am I Catholic? And that was when I started getting into theology, actually, and I started reading some, some great books that in, included authors like John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict, and I was so taken, and I thought, here's the truth, and it speaks to, to human life, to my heart. It's so compelling if people would just know this vision, and I got so excited about it, so excited about being Catholic, Then I then decided, actually, I need to take a year off from my studies to join Net Ministries and evangelize young people in the United States, and so I did that for a year. And over the course of that year, with the help of my teammates, um, we were reading some theology together, and we thought, this is amazing. And I thought, this is what I want to, to do, is to study this, to bring this to people, because this truth is so powerful, this wisdom so compelling. And if only people could hear it. And I think my answer to your question, Doug, would be, if only people would hear it. And that is, we're so distracted these days. We have so many things. T.S. Eliot says in the Four Quartets that we're distracted from distraction by distraction. And, and Crown probably wrote that in 1920, right? <laughs> yeah. And I, mean, I think this is, this is true. The truth is not sort of an easy um, capture, an easy thing to get a hold of. It takes work, and it takes attention. And this is where the persecution, I think, of the Eastern um, Catholics comes into play. When you're face-to-face with death, there are no distractions. It's clear that death really asks, brings the question to the light, what is the meaning of life? And you realize... It's not in this or that device or gadget or this or that game or this or that whatever. The meaning of life is, what is it to be a man? What is my origin? What is my destiny? And that is to, to gaze upon God, the Holy right. Trinity. And once we're, we start asking those questions, then it's really the Catholic faith that gives answers that are compelling, that are whole and rich and draw you in. And that's what drew me in right. and brought me all the way to Austria from America and I've loved it. I would never go, go back to where I was before. Um, I was studying music, and I loved it, and I still do music, actually. I direct the choir at the ITI, and we mm-hmm. sing some beautiful things. I write some liturgical music and um, still use it, but I and love yeah. theology. And yeah, some people watching this show would say, well, this is so academic. You guys are detached. But, you know, I was thinking, you know, this big global economic downturn we're in right now, you know, Pope Benedict says, you know, we have to look at greed as one of the sources, the causes of this, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, to know what a moral life is, how to behave, you know, so as, as if we're formed properly, we can take this message to the world that has, you know, extreme consequences on the world. Now, you all talk something, uh, we're going to get to the four pillars of the school. Let me just... Well, well, and we're hitting it. We're, we, we're, we're covering them. We're so. covering it? Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I like, you, know, you talk about going back to the sources to study, and you all are not only doing that at this school, you're going back to the locations you know, where these things were first written and some of the great schools of Europe. Can you talk about, uh, Catherine, the advantage of being in Europe studying these things? Oh, yeah. I, I didn't actually expect that that would be such a big part of my experience there, but... There's, there's a way that, uh, that being present um, closer to the roots of Christianity is life-changing, no matter where you are in your faith. Mm-hmm. Um, the ITI would, what would often happen is they'd get a couple of buses, you know, and the students, almost all of them usually, um, professors and families whole, with all their little children, you know, would spend a whole night on the bus, two whole nights on the bus, um, it's a lot of sacrifice, you know, with little kids sleeping on yeah. your head and right, you know, right. <laughs> no bathroom for mom. It's, it's really, I mean, it really is a sacrifice, but um, doing it together and going to places like Le Zoo, to mm-hmm. Lourdes, to ours, to the cave where Mary Magdalene spent the last years of her life in mm-hmm. prayer, to tours where, um, what was it, Toulouse, to where the, the relics of St. Thomas mm-hmm. are. Um, and those, just to see yeah. the great cathedrals, the great museums yeah, absolutely. of Europe. Yeah, those experiences are, uh, on the level of the community, they're irreplaceable because there's something about not just being in the classroom together or even being uh, at Mass together, which is actually really the center, but suffering together for the sake of something very loved. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the fact that you're willing to go that far to see right. those things is a mm-hmm. g- real source of grace. And it's as a community and as an individual because there's just nothing, there's nothing like standing humbly before the foundations. Yeah. And it's something, too, about being part of something new and uh, simple beginnings, you know, where people have to yeah. contribute more. You all talk about that, how different students um, actually contribute to the running of the school, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a, a, a great um, 
a great way that everyone's involved and brought together in community, which is student work. And everyone takes a bit of responsibility in the places that we live, the tasks that need to be done. Um, I help out with the choir and organ and, and these sorts mm-hmm. of things. And this has the practical benefit that everything keeps running and working and common areas are clean and this, is, this helps the, the speculative activity of studying. But it also has a, a beautiful communal benefit, which is it brings people together and you see that we actually love each other through our actions. We serve each other in the things that we're doing mm-hmm. and um, it teaches us how to, to work together as a community as, as a body of Christ in a very practical way where one person does one thing, the eye does this, the ear does that, mm-hmm. and the product is mm-hmm. a well-operating, well-functioning body. And I love that theme, too, that you all speak about of, of true, like, Catholic universality. And I thought it's, such, it's good coming from you, Scott, because you're, you were at Berkeley, the icon of multiculturalism that kind of prides itself on we're all getting along here. We're all right. united, right? <laughs> but Catholicism takes that to a whole new level. Just you know, we might, we're united all in our humanity and in a certain level that. But in the faith, it's a new level, isn't it? Could you all talk about that? The universality that the truth unites. Yeah, I think. I mean, earlier what I was mentioning, I think, was you know, at Berkeley, it's multiculturalism is the word of the day, or diversity, or affirmative action. And as you said, Father, mm-hmm. it's sort of like we're Catholic. We don't need these slogans we're already universal that's what catholic means and that really comes together in in an extremely profound way at at the iti and uh, one of our um, priests was even mentioning to me he had studied in rome and rome is the eternal city it's the heart of the church and we love it we take pilgrimages there Um, and in rome you have all of these different communities in different colleges and so you have a great representation of the universal church there the embodiment of it but at the iti it's almost to a new extreme because It's not individual institutes or universities, but it's one institute. It's one family and all these different colors and ways and um, this beautiful symphony or fabric woven at at this one Mm -hmm. place where you really see the universal church. Catherine, you were mentioning earlier about all the different states of life or... Um, that we have yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. It's um, it's not artificial. It wasn't like somebody said, here, let's get a sample of every sort of life in the church and glue it all together or something like that. I mean, everybody came, and this is this is the thing, for the one thing, for the truth, for wisdom mm-hmm. in the one true faith. And that genuine love is a source of unity already. You're not looking for an artificial unity bringing things together. But what happens is all of those people are bringing the richness of the church that one individual doesn't recognize. The church is so rich and so big and diverse in a good way, <laughs> in a way that's not com- competitive but complementary. And for me, that was a, a little example of a way to, that that was experienced for me was um, the Byzantine Rite has a prayer called the Akathist Hymn, which is like a half-hour sung hymn to Our Lady. It's a little bit like the rosary is in the, in the Latin church. And uh, the whole community, once a week, um, or, you know, whoever was available at the time, whatever the priests and all the people from both, both sides, uh, east and west, would come and sing this together. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful, so it's very moving in that way. But um, there was no sense of, all right, now I'm going to do this foreign thing. I'm not really sure why they do this or whatever. As soon as you start and you see those words which express the same faith that you've grown up with, but in a new way, in a way that has all kinds of new lights for you, you feel that it's your own. Right. This belongs to the church, and so it's mine. You're singing about you know? the same reality. Yeah. 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 And that unity is not, it's not made by us. It's already there. I kind of experienced know? that. on what, We went to Rome for the close for the year. A priest, Father Miguel and I, and uh, we would sing, and we'd take turns. Cause he had, like, Spanish. He had some um, Italians. And we would take turns singing different parts of the Mass, you know, mm-hmm. and... Uh, We'd know enough to know what we were singing about and you know, know what they were singing about. But yeah. I love that. It, it was, a, it was a, an accommodation for each or a complementarity. And it's also humbling, you know, to realize that, hey, I, I don't have the full picture of spirituality or you don't have yeah. to do it my way, so to speak. You know, I can learn mm-hmm. from you. And uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a minute with the ITI.
Hi, welcome back to Life on the Rock. And Eugene, you had a follow-up comment. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I thought uh, Catherine and Scott did a great job. I, the, the common thirst for wisdom and the virtuous life draws Catholics from all around the world together. And that's, a, that's important. Our motto is Secret Service Ad Fontes, to, to the sources, to, to the font of, of wisdom and the font of life. And our studies are in English. And so to have people from Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Albania, Croatia, the Ukraine, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, from Slovakia, Slovenia, to have them coming together. And, and then Catherine's point about the pilgrimages, to go to Slovakia on a pilgrimage is one thing. To go with Slovakians mm -hmm. is powerful. It breaks open. You, you stay in the homes, you see the sights through their eyes. And so th this universality coming together as Catholics mm -hmm. thirsting for the virtuous life, is, it's phenomenal. And uh, to come together and then have the, the four pillars. And mm -hmm. Scott was going to talk about. Yeah, the four pillars are kind of the, the foundational elements of, of how we do things, what makes us unique at the ITI. And um, the first one is that we study theology as a unified whole. There's a great unity to theology. and. It can't just be broken apart or splintered into random classes. We have a, a nicely ordered, a beautiful, wise curriculum that way. And within this whole, particular attention is devoted to marriage and the family. And we see ourselves really in the service of marriage and the family because this is one of the essential ways that the new evangelization happens. And, um, and marriage and family then enlightens theology because God in Scripture um, has chosen marital images as a way of conveying his, his truth about himself to us. And so... It's a, a kind of mutual interplay there, and it's the first pillar. And the second one is the international character bridging of East and West that we've talked about. And here we have, we shared many stories already, and the Eastern Fathers are read in addition to the Western Fathers, and this um, enriches the theological studies. Um, the third pillar is a, an active pedagogy, which Catherine mentioned. She wanted a, a place where you can discuss the text and work hard because wisdom asks a lot of you to have it. And so we, we work hard, we discuss and prepare texts, and... Um, bring them to class, and we're led by a, a professor, and we work together as disciples of the truth. And then the, the fourth one is that we live together as a community, and we pray together as a community, because theology is only done um, on our knees, and we realize that, and so we spend time in prayer together, personal prayer, and this um, contributes again to going to the sources and to building the solid theological um, foundation. Mm -hmm. Now, what do, what do, what's typical of, of graduates of the ITI, where do they go on? You have a lot of vocations, I know. You, you talk about some of the different paths people <coughs> take. Well, my roommate and I took pretty diverse paths. Mm -hmm. um, we shared a lot studying together. We had all the same classes the last couple of years, and really, I don't think I would have made it without her, and, but hopefully vice versa, <laughs> I would have contributed something. But you shared she's notes now, and stuff? Yeah, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, writing each other's paper. Yeah. No, not at all. But <laughs> she was, um, she's an Austrian natively, mm -hmm. and she's now... Um, finishing up her first year in a contemplative monastery in Austria. Mm. So she really took um, a radical way to make a gift of her life to the church, which wow. inspires me every day in my work, <laughs> which right. is very different. I'm now working on my doctorate at Ave Maria University, which is very hard, probably not hard in the same way that <laughs> her life is, but mm -hmm. um, I think there's no question that each of us would answer, did the ITI prepare you for this with the same enthusiasm? Um, both in the prayer life and in the classroom, I think it's really important. Um, the experience of studying at the, p the doctoral level in the States with master's students who went to other master's degree programs, mm -hmm. both in the States and out of it, um, to feel confident, mm -hmm. to feel well-formed, and that you have a solid foundation to build on. I mean, it's really, that's the proof to me that it was a good education. You know? And you would hope to be a teacher? Yeah, I hope God willing, and if that's his plan for me to use what I've learned in both schools and mm -hmm. elsewhere to, to carry on the same work. Now, Scott, we forgot to mention you're married mm -hmm. and you have a eight-week-old? Eight-week-old baby boy. Yeah, and you had to describe what you're wearing there. Yeah, this is a, That's a kind just of not UC Berkeley traditional Hill. That's a <laughs> <laughs> this is a traditional Austrian coat, and um, there are a lot of different styles, and I, I like a lot of the Austrian culture. There are a lot of cultural artifacts that pop up everywhere in clothing and yeah. random shrines and I think it's a beautiful thing about Europe and Austria in particular so I'm wearing that um, I met my wife at the ITI she graduated from the ITI and um, I met this beautiful girl there and we got married and um, she's Austrian she's Austrian mm -hmm. and eight weeks ago our, our first baby a baby boy was born and he's beautiful and I love him and miss him being here and uh, are those bones on your jacket 
I think it's wood. Oh. I think it's wood. <laughs> yeah, but it does kind of have a little bit of a it looks skeletal like a, look. It does, it? yeah. <laughs> yeah it's kind of a gothic. And the hat is just a... This is an American hat, so I'm kind of a, a mishmash of, of well, cultures. That's from right your now. California roots. <laughs> that is the California root right there. <laughs> now, Eugene, you, you're in the business world. You talk because you're the first class from the ITI. And how? What have you done with your education? Uh, what I did, uh, I came back uh, with my wife. We, my wife and I, uh, went over with four children and participating in the ITI and studies and marriage and the family. Uh, as a part of that, we had a fifth. We have a little. Uh, our youngest daughter was born in Austria. Came back, worked at the University of Dallas uh, as associate director of a graduate theology program. And I left that for six reasons, my wife and five children. Uh, <laughs> uh, Catholic higher education, uh, maybe I'll put this out as a general call, could pay more money to those who work there. So, But uh, I was led to start a business reaching out to family-owned and closely held businesses. I work with presidents and CEOs and peer mentoring groups, and I do succession planning and strategic planning. And I use the formation that I received at the ITI every single day. It's the pursuit of the virtuous life, directly applicable to the development of these presidents and CEOs, the development of their successors, the transition of their business from one generation to the next. These principles uh, and the formation that I received in pursuit of wisdom uh, is their gift, and I'm able to share that gift, and and it pays uh, a little bit better than <laughs> higher Catholic higher education. I know you would think on one level, okay, you know, the the moral life here, what does it really have to do with capitalism? But we see capitalism struggling without a moral life. That's right. And that's I, right. So I think that's so. Sometimes we don't make that connection. It's a critical mm -hmm. co connection. Uh, uh, Many great Catholic business owners are, uh, have this moral foundation. Uh, it, it's critical that we have that formation and we share it with those whom we serve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was uh, in the future for the school? Is there any uh, immediate plans or? Oh, there's yeah, just to uh, thrive. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm honored yeah. to be on the board of trustees. We. We really, uh, as we, we seek to create this, uh, sustain this forum, we're, we're looking for, for people who are thirsty for the truth. Uh, we're looking for partners to support us. We, we uh, subsidize the Eastern European uh, students significantly, and there are a lot of organizations that do. So we, we're, oh, God's providence has been wonderful, and uh, he sustains us. And uh, for those who are called, uh, we, we ask for their help in sustaining the ITI. Mm -hmm. Definitely worthwhile. What, as we have a, f a couple minutes left, what are some of the stories of, of impact maybe some of the students have had that you all know, graduates, uh, that how they've impacted the culture, where they're at? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the, the big successes uh, recently, we started um, this leadership forum as a summer program for business executives. And um, it was the first time we did it, and we were a little unsure how it would turn out. Um, but it was... Quite, quite a success, and each of these um, individuals that came and participated um, shared with us some great stories of how they, how much they learned, how much it enlightened their view of their their work in the business world, and what they want to now do and go back with that. So this sort of transformational story in, in a week's time, a week of um, seminars and, and talking together and praying together, and if that can happen in a week, then imagine in the the whole course of studies, it's even even more so as, as Eugene mentioned we're yeah. excited for students who are coming and especially American students are wonderful we have a number there and um, the Americans bring a great spirit and so um, mm -hmm. we're all from America the courses are in English so it's mm -hmm. it's really a perfect opportunity to discover the universal church the culture of Europe and Catholic wisdom for for Americans to see kind of the bigger the bigger world out there and to dive right in what is our, I'm sorry our first annual leadership forum was a success. We'll have another. So we want to invite partners, leaders to participate. It's not only for for people who are studying full time, but folks who want to taste, want to pursue the truth and, and wisdom and the virtuous life. What is the the kind of the American contribution, our cultural, to the ITI? You think? Great question. Yeah, it's, the Americans have a, a fantastic spirit. I think mm -hmm. um, there there are a lot of things that could be said, but I remember an author that I really like, Joseph Pieper was saying that um, he read a text that has a certain freshness and openness of mind that could only have been written in America. And what he meant by that is there's this kind of adventurous spirit in America that um, has to do with spreading out through this great wide land. And when you 
sort of infuse that in the academic sphere. It gives this great kind of passion for learning and appreciation of learning and willingness to discuss and being active. And so the Americans really contribute a lot to the discussion of the text, to get right in there and work mm -hmm. with it and divide the text and understand it. And um, in this way, they bring a lot of life, a lot of life to the community. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Life on the Rock. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next week, we're going to have the Ladies of Cecilia. And so uh, I want to be sure to join us. And Doug, any parting, parting words for us tonight? Yeah. Uh, elections coming up soon. Let's make sure we're voting the right direction, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot at stake. Okay. The Lord be with you. Also also with you. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you and give you His peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week.